What's up, students? In my last video, I talked about everything that I saw as wrong with poli-sci, political science, as it was taught to me and as it seems to be taught to everybody else. I wanted this week to give you a good reading list, a kind of alternative reading list that you don't usually learn in poli-sci, but that is actually still relevant and that we probably should have learned, but that I didn't learn until much later. Uh, there's a few things I want to talk about before uh, I get into the books themselves. Um, so again, if you went into a poli-sci class, you would find a very different reading list. That's okay, you know, you could always read those books as well. I just think they don't really cut to the point and cut to the problem itself. They'll maybe give a kind of vague structural overview of certain things in in the political world, but but maybe they don't say um, give you the full picture, as it were. The books that I'm recommending today, I think they're much more important. Uh, and incisive than the standard fare. Before I start listing topics and books, it's important to know where to find them. Google, obviously, is, uh, is a really useful tool, but you might like to know of specific places where you can find somewhere, and um, probably the best place is a website, which, uh, right, it has to move around a lot, but right now it's B dash okay dot cc and i want to say it like that because um a lot of platforms don't actually let you post it because it's like an illegal website or something like that i don't even know um but b dash okay dot cc i've found tons of books including all the ones i'm going to recommend today another thing that i think is important before we get into the books themselves, is how to read a book. Most people, um, they don't know, um, they, they don't think of reading as having goals. But really, if you are going to read a book, it's good to have a goal. What's your goal to get out of it? Is there um, something specific? that the book is about that you can extract from it? And if so, do you need to read anything beyond that? Do you need to read the introduction or the conclusion, for, for example? Maybe, maybe not, but I would recommend you do. In fact, I'd recommend that you read, that you at least look at every part of a book, all of it. For example, um, look at the date when it was made. That's relevant. Sometimes I read it and I'm shocked. Oh, I figured this was present day. It was made 50 years ago. Sometimes things feel very modern and very relevant when they've, they're ideas that have been around for a long time. It would also, you know, also read things like the preface and the introduction. Um, the ta the um, table of contents is really important. It's a, it's a road map for where you're going with the book. And also I like to look at the bibliography because, uh, you know, even before you start, you can look at the bibliography. And if nothing else, it gives you the idea for some other books that you might want to read. Um, now, when you're, when you're reading these books, the ideal, I would say, would be to do it with a book club. In fact, that's kind of the whole point of this, is how not just to to read a book, but how to organize a book club and uh, talk about these really important issues through reading. Again, the ideal is to have a facilitator who's already read and analyzed these books, you know, and that that's kind of the point of having a professor, right? So... Obviously, if you really want to pay for the education, then you can get a professor to do it. If not, that's okay. There's still plenty of ways of analyzing a text without, without having an expert to do it for you or, or to do it with you. 
But either way, incorporate some kind of discussion with other people into it, if you can. Uh, because that's one of the best ways of of understanding what people mean. Maybe you understood this part, and someone else in the group understood that part, and you can kind of explain them to each other. There's, uh, there's always going to be some people who are interested in the same books. You don't have to do it uh, in person. You, it can all be online. Everything could be online nowadays. And it would also help you to Google something uh, about one about these books and about the authors before you read them. Learning about the author's life, um, looking at the other titles that they've written. These are good ways of situating the book into a context and that helps you to remember and it helps you learn. One more thing before I list some some books is um, the, the key to all of this is critical thinking, right? So think critically about the material, question things, right, and discuss them. But also it would, would help to learn things about critical thinking before you even start, you know? There are plenty of books on critical thinking. There are plenty of books on logic. There are lots of places you can learn about your cognitive biases. Lots of psychology books on that topic. But, I mean, even just the Wikipedia article on co on your cognitive biases is, I found, extremely useful. It lists tons of these biases that we fall prey to every day. So it's good to know for your... It's, for yourself, but maybe especially for analyzing others. <laughs> um, it's great to know one's cognitive biases. It's great to analyze arguments logically. But remember that contrary to what some people seem to think, logic is not the end, the be-all and end-all of, of something. It doesn't necessarily make something true or false. <laughs> I'm going to be recommending books here, but if you can find, like, videos or or uh, just a website summarizing a book, you could always just do that instead, you know, if, if you had to, if you didn't have time or something, or if you do have time, and uh, a good way of, of learning is to read that summary first and all the other little parts of a book, and then delve into the book. It I think it's a really good way of helping you remember, helping you learn. Yeah. So, let's get to it, shall we? The first book that I'm going to recommend is Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now, why do I recommend this book first and foremost? Most, most of the books I'm going to say are not in any particular order, but this one I would suggest to read first. The whole point of this book is for the oppressed, for normal people, to analyze the the systems around themselves, you know, together, like on their own, but in, in groups. Like, that's, that's a big part of it, um, coming together in groups. You want to solve these big problems that you're facing in the world, but you need to analyze your situation first. And you want to change things, but it's got to be based on that analysis, on your analysis. And the way I see it, whatever you think of um, the, the topics that I talk about on this channel, you know, capitalism, the state, racism, imperialism, if your situation is different from what I describe, then what then I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what your problem is or how to solve it. Whereas if you follow the formula in pedagogy of the of the oppressed, you'll well you'll figure it out for yourself. And that's really the core I think of of my philosophy is that you've got to figure these things out for yourself. So I would definitely start with pedagogy. 
And because the whole point of applying, the, the whole point here is to read and apply things, the second book I'm going to recommend is Manufacturing Consent by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. I, I recommend that one because it's one of those things you can apply as you read it. If you've ever seen the news, ever, <laughs> um, or if you just want to know how the news is made and how it kind of indoctrinates people, then manufacturing consent. That's, that's what you're looking for. After, um, after these, I don't know if there's really an order in which I'll recommend the rest of the books and the topics. Uh, I, I mean, I still think that it's important to analyze the system as a whole, and that's where the rest of these books are coming from. To say exactly which books you should read in which order, well, that's really up to you. Start with Pedagogy of the Oppressed, but the rest of them doesn't really matter. I personally would recommend uh, some elite theory, contrary to what a lot of people would do. Um, and one starting point with that is The Power Elite by C. Wright Mills. But there's also, I mean, on the same kind of page, there's Who Rules America, or maybe The Power Elite and the State by William Domhoff. I've read other kind of elitist theory. There's other people. There's like Mosca. There's Pareto. You can learn about them, sure. They're all interesting. They're all very useful. I would say the power elite and Who Rules America are great introductions to the, um, the origins of inequality and their sociological work, so again, they help you to analyze your own situation. Those are based on the U.S., but maybe, you know, maybe your situation is similar. I would also recommend lots of books on how to think critically about history, because history is so important. You want to uh, learn all about history. You'll, you'll need to know the history of something in order to really understand it and analyze it, so it's good to be able to think critically about history. So, some books on that topic. The number one that I would recommend, even if you're not American, is Lies My Teacher Told Me, um, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong by James Lowen. Great book, really easy to read, very accessible, and really interesting, because if, you, if you've heard any if you've ever been instructed in American history, you realize how little um, that, that you've been told is actually true. Um, on, on a similar note, maybe A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. And An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. I mean, they're all up to you. These are just a couple of suggestions, these two people's history books, because American history is, you know, it's so important, and indigenous people have been integral to that history, and you don't, you know, you don't, you don't talk about them enough nowadays. We, we talk about them as, as if they're irrelevant when when indigenous people have are, are so relevant to the founding and the current state even of uh, of the united states there are a couple i mean really there are lots of books about helping you think critically about history i don't know them all <laughs> i can only recommend these uh, history as mystery by michael parenti and maybe in, in the same category, Dangerous Games, The Uses and Abuses of History by Margaret Macmillan. It's useful uh, whenever reading some authors, especially history, to read criticism of the authors and the books that you're, you're interested in reading, maybe before or after or during while you're reading it. That's okay. Just remember, just bear in mind, I think that Criticism is really easy to make, and it's not always fair. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, once you've done read those books, you're probably ready to read more in depth into history. And so that will depend on your interests and your situation and again, your goals. But one possible field of interest for you could be the origin of the state. After all, the state is the main oppressor, the main uh, source of domination in our society, so it's pretty important to know where it came from. You could read War and the Rise of the State by Bruce Porter. It's a good uh, look at the medieval state in Western Europe and where it came from. As you can imagine from the title, it's it's basically that um, that various wars, various conquests are what propelled the state into um, in, into modernity. Now we got the modern nation state. Well, where did it come from? Uh, War and the Rise of the State is a great intro to that. Although, like like a lot of other books, uh, it it's a little bit dry. You might not want to read all the details. I could certainly understand that. Um, in the same kind of canon of the the rise of the state is the rise and decline of the state by Martin Van Creveld, and the rise and decline of the nation state. Uh, both of these books. You know, they sound similar. They're they're quite a bit different, but um, they certainly give a lot of interesting historical perspective on uh, this uh, on this topic. And finally, you could read *The State* by Franz Oppenheimer, which I think cuts to what the state really is more than most of these other books. Sorry, I didn't mean to say finally, because there's one other book on the state. In fact, I might consider this one essential reading, Against the Grain, by James C. Scott. Because the other books, while they talk about the, the state and its origins, this one is the most recent one based on the most recent research. So it's... Been, so it's extremely interesting that way, and it's just a bit more reliable, you know, you, because, again, it talks about what the latest research is. So it's a bit more plausible than the others, and it, it really blows all the old hypotheses out of the water. All, all of, you know, when, when people used to say things like, uh, the state was was created by people who wanted to you know because people wanted to cooperate it's going to coordinate cooperation and production no 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 that is absolutely not where the state came from it's just propaganda okay so let's move on a little bit that was the origin of the state very important but what about the origins of capitalism that's the dominant economic system and indeed political system that we live under that most of the world lives under even now obviously you could read capital by marx except you know a couple of things to note about capital first um of course they do teach marx already in in political science not necessarily all of them i didn't learn marx in in my classes but in a lot of uh, in political philosophy classes, modern political philosophy classes, they'll they'll talk about Marx almost definitely because he's he's a very important figure. Um, but the other problem with capital, of course, is that it's huge and it's very dense. So this is one of the ones those the ones definitely it's good to have a companion for. In fact, pretty sure there are companion readers for capital. Um, but books that they they should have taught us but didn't. I've always I'm always recommending this book to everybody who's interested in in the history of capitalism, the invention of capitalism by Michael Perelman. I really think it's it's an excellent book and it reveals the um, the violent origins 
of capitalism as we know it. And in addition to that, it, it, it teaches a couple of other things because it looks at how capitalism really developed. It looks at the actual history of it, um, particularly in, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, but it also, it, um, you know, because it was happening at the same time, it also looks at what classical political economists said to legitimize capitalism. And, and it's interesting because whatever your thoughts on people like Adam Smith and Jeremy Bentham are, you, they, they'll probably change as a result of reading this book. So recommend it highly. There's uh, Capitalism and Slavery by Eric Williams, showing the huge, uh, the the huge amount, the, the huge amount of wealth that slavery created, and how it was integral to uh, developing capitalism into what it is today. And really, there are lots of books on that topic, capitalism and slavery. And in fact, really, what we're talking about here is political economy, inter especially international or global political economy. And it's there are tons and tons of books on this this subject because it's such a big subject. You know, it's kind of describing how the entire economy works and how that affects everything. So it's a huge topic. So there are tons of books on it. I'm just giving you um, a few titles on it. And by the way, you can read economics if you like. Um, I, I'm not going to recommend any of that because... Economics doesn't tell you how the system works like political economy does. Uh, there's also How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney. Another, uh, another big recommendation for how uh, understanding how systems work. I mean, it's not just about Africa. After all, underdeveloping Africa means that uh, Europe and and parts of the Americas maybe got, uh, you know, got wealthy as a result of that. So, so it's not just about Africa. Um, and if, again, if we're looking at the whole system, I kind of recommend uh, the Prison Notebooks by Antonio Gramsci. You, uh, one of one of the great uh, important topics in this book is hegemony and how a, kind of a small group of people can end up establishing dominance, not just through military might, but through ideas and what eventually came to be called soft power, and how all those things are, are spread internationally. I found it really interesting from that point of view. So that's political economy, but there's always, again, there's so many titles to add to it. Maybe the works of Immanuel Wallerstein, um, again, a kind of global political economy theorist. David Harvey, he's written a lot on this. Ha Jun Chang. There, there really are lots of authors. If you get started, the good thing is if you get started and if you, uh, you know, if you Google these people and stuff... For sure, you'll find lots more people with more titles and stuff that you'll be interested in reading. That you can put on your list, and it, I mean, it goes to show I have like thousands of books on my list, that, most of which I'm sure I'll never actually get to. The next category of books that I'm going to recommend is books on propaganda. And I mean, it. It depends on you, but sometimes I think propaganda is the number one thing that we should be uh, learning, and, and almost before anything else, because prop learning about how propaganda works, I think, I think at least, is key to helping you unlearn all the, the lies and the, the nonsense and the bad ideas that you and I have picked up over the years. And at least, at the very least, being aware of propaganda is important. So um, we saw manufacturing consent. That was important. But there's also Propaganda by Edward Bernays. This is the guy who 
who kind of invented modern propaganda. You know, read, read about him, Google him. Uh, you, you'll read all about him. He, he wrote a bunch of books on propaganda, and they're, they're a little bit confusing to me because I, because he seems to be telling the truth, you know, but it's weird that he would kind of throw these huge secrets out there to everybody so everybody could find out how they're being screwed, how they're being lied to. But, hey, there you go. It's all, uh, it's all there for you. One of my favorite books on propaganda is uh, Propaganda by Jacques Ellul. Uh, I found that to be um, integral to my understanding of the topic. Um, and to be a little specific, uh, is War Made Easy. This is a really um, interesting and accessible book, easy to read. And it's really about war propaganda. So it's kind of applying what we hear, what we read about propaganda in those other two books, or however many books you want to read on it, and uh, applying it to to U.S. foreign policy. <clears throat> Now, we're talking about thinking critically about propaganda and uh, the dominant ideas of society, and I think that will be a good segue into imperialism, because imperialism affects, well, all of us in one way or another. And if you're going to be uh, reading about wars, you're eventually going to be reading about the Middle East and the, the so-called Muslim world, although, you know, I've, I've made videos on that if you want to see why I don't usually use that term. And a good, um, a good primer for that would be Orientalism by Edward Said. The thing about Orientalism is that it helps, it helps people like me, you know, white you know, white people born born in North America, you know, it helps people like me to understand the extent to which um, the, the places like the Middle East have been exoticized. How they, for hundreds of years now, we've been hearing all kinds of nonsense about, about those people that just just coincidentally were the targets of imperialism at the time. You know, this book is still just as relevant, I would say, because there's still uh, so much of this Orientalism used to, to continue to legitimize wars. So it's great, and it's part of the canon on this topic, on the whole... Uh, topic of Orientalism and and uh, your, your skewed perspective as uh, as a person coming from you know Europe or the Americas or something you'll get this very skewed perspective, this kind of cultural bias, and there's really no reason why that would be, except that we've been lied to. Orientalism is is a great introduction to that uh, to that subject. It's, it's an introduction to all kind of imperialism. And there's, there's others uh, that I've mentioned that you can read on this subject, you know, like Capital or the Prison Notebooks, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, An Indigenous People's History of the U.S. And there are tons of books on U.S. foreign policy. And I'm just going to re recommend a few, but there really are so many that that you should uh, read widely of them. But, you know, just to... To introduce the topic, at least, to skim the surface, let's try uh, Sewing Crisis by Rashid Khalidi, which is a great uh, intro to the Cold War and uh, in, in the Middle East. And uh, there, there's a trilogy by uh, Chalmers Johnson on U.S. foreign policy that I think is pretty interesting. I don't agree with, you know, everything he says, of course, but then you could say that about all these authors. Um, he did this trilogy of, uh, of books. I don't even know which order they're in, but uh, there's Blowback, Nemesis, and The Sorrows of Empire. And they're all on basically the same topic. I, I found them really interesting, easy to read, you know. Um, 
similar note as uh, Orientalism and Sewing Crisis is Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire by Deepa Kumar. And you could get, uh, you know, she's she's made some really good lectures on YouTube. You can read where she uh, she gives a pretty good um, overview of her work. You can just learn a lot just from that if you wanted to. Um, who else? Uh, maybe the work of Andrew Basevich. He he's done plenty of good books on uh, the role of the U.S. military, especially in Empire. So it's been pretty interesting. Um, like all my suggestions, these are just a start, an introduction to to this. But I think if you read these books, you will get a very clear idea of the wars and the continuity of U.S. foreign policy. Let's get into the politics of resistance, revolution, and liberation. Again, there are, you know, a million titles in this, but it would have been nice, I, I think, when I was younger, to at least have known about these books, to known they were an option. <laughs> Again, start with Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I would definitely start with that one. Uh, but then you can move on to The Wretched of the Earth by Frantz Fanon, a classic, the classic decolonization text. And uh, how, you know, colonized people should resist. There's also Peter Gelderloos's How Nonviolence Protects the State. And I think a book like that, or the next one that I'm going to recommend, Pacifism as Pathology by Ward Churchill. Books like that I recommend because we're so inundated in our culture with... Um, you know, with this trope about how a protest is okay, but only if you do it peacefully, and everything has to be peaceful. No matter how much violence the state uses, or just the right wing uses to crush you, you're never allowed to use any violence to fight back, or it discredits and destroys your cause. And that's kind of bullshit, and there are reasons that that we've been indoctrinated into these beliefs, and I think these are a couple of books that are useful ways of getting out of it. You might even try the Huey P. Newton Reader, because um, Huey's been such a great, uh, such an, a great figure and a, such a wise person in resistance. But you could also just read about social movements, rebel movements, decolonization, and whatever revolutionary strategy. There are other topics that that we should have read and that you that I'd recommend you read about, you know, like intersectional feminism, for example. Read more about decolonization. It's important. Read the history of the land that you live on. But um and, and there are so many miscellaneous books that I can recommend, but I've already talked about them in other videos and linked to them in the description of those videos, or else I will in the future. <laughs> and hey, I'm just one guy, so check out other people with like the same interests as you. Check out what book clubs they're doing, you know? Um, join online book clubs, or again, just, just look at what they're reading for people of similar interests. So once you begin reading with a purpose, with a goal, knowing what you want to get out of it, then you can decide what parts of the book you can read um, and what on that topic you're going to pursue after you're done with the book. If you really want to learn it and remember it, it helps to discuss it with other people, and even more importantly, to apply it to your reality, to analyze your situation and your history through the eyes of these authors. What you read and how you interpret it and, and what you do with it all depends on your situation. And I'd love to hear how it goes for you. So those are my recommendations on what to read and how to read them. So I hope you enjoyed it. 
If you have any questions, if you want any more recommendations, comment on this video. Thanks a lot.